Well, hey, New City, and welcome back to our midweek service. Uh, as we get ready, I want to let you know a couple of things. One, go ahead and hit that share button for your friends, family, so they can join in on what we're going to be doing this evening. And even hit like, hit that heart, whatever the emoji you're feeling or that you want to feel after this. Hit that and let people know what we're doing. Uh, this not evening, we're going to talk about this idea of progress over perfection. So how can we make, continue to make progress in our life, whether in our health, our faith, our relationships with each other, or with our spouse, with our kids, with our roommates, whoever you find yourself around 24-7 these days. What does it look like to make progress in that? And how do we let Jesus impact us and encourage us during this time? And so as we begin together, I'm joined here with Kevin, and he's going to lead us in a song of worship, and then we're going to dive into uh, the Word this evening. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin But lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested my life began The ash was redeemed, only beauty remains my orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace, so free, washes over me. You have made me new now, life begins with you it's your endless love pouring down on us you have made us do now life begins with you released from my chains I'm a prisoner no more and by shame was a ransom he canceled my debt and he called me his friend When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over me You have made me new now life begins with you It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us do now life begins with you. Our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoices, though Kevin had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free while she's Awesome. 
thanks, Kevin, for leading us this evening. I want to spend just a few minutes uh, diving into Scripture and sharing with you one of my absolute favorite passages in the entire Bible. And so as we do that, we're looking at this theme of progress over perfection. So I want to start with this question. What do you think is the biggest prohibitor to progress? For us making progress in our life, again, whether it's spiritually, financially, uh, in our careers, maybe a hobby, a job that we enjoy, what is the biggest prohibitor? Now, we might think laziness, maybe lack of drive sometimes, maybe not being scheduled or maybe not being organized or the coronavirus and so we're at home, so maybe I can't, for my health, I can't work out. And, and all those things may be valid, uh, but I do not think they're actually the biggest prohibitor that stops us from experiencing progress. And so that's what we're going to look at this evening. Now, as I begin, I want to start with this premise. That Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people live. And so as we talk about progress, Jesus impacts not just our spiritual uh, and and faith side of our life. He also impacts every area of our life, whether our our health, our relationships with one another, how we treat people, our finances. He cares about everything because he cares about us. And so again, he didn't come to make bad people good. Following Jesus is not about a behavior modification for him to love us more. It's about us experiencing life. Now, ultimately, in his kingdom, when he returns, all those who have trusted and follow in Jesus will experience life to that perfect degree that we all aspire for. But until then, even in this life today, even in the midst of difficulties and the hardships that life might throw at us, Jesus has still provided us a way for us to experience life, even in the midst of those things. And so with that, here's what it says in John, 1 John chapter 5. Uh, sorry, First John chapter 1, starting in verse 5. Again, one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Give you some context for this book. John uh, was the only disciple of Jesus that wasn't killed for claiming that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, tradition has it that he was burned alive with oil, and then he survived, and he was set in exile to the island of Patmos for the rest of his life, where he wrote the Gospel of John and the book of Revelation, as well as First, Second, and Third John, it's interesting that he was not living a life that anybody would actually want. He was in some ways kind of quarantined and in isolation, and he wrote some of the most impactful words in all of creation. And so that's where John found himself, where he writes this, starting in verse 5. He's talking about us having fellowship with God and experiencing him. Here's what he says. He says, this is the message we have heard from him and declared to you. God is light, and there is absolutely no darkness in him, that he is perfect and righteous and holy and pure. There is no darkness in him. Verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we are lying and not practicing the truth. So if you and I claim to be following Jesus, but yet we're walking in patterns of sin and do not care about our actions and what we do, we're we're saying, well, maybe we don't actually trust and believe in Jesus like we say we do. Verse 7, If we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, or sorry, the blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us from all sin. So we follow Jesus and we experience the light, not based on what we do, but based on the goodness and the forgiveness that he has given us. And if we actually trust in Jesus, although we're not saved by how we live, it should impact how we live. If we follow Jesus, who is the light, We'll experience the light in our lives. So verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And so while we're trying to pursue Jesus and love others well, the reality is you and I are fallen beings, so we will fall short, and we will sin. So it's not about being perfect, because we can't be, but instead it's about leaning into following him and allowing him impact our life. And so here's what we should do when we fall short, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he, God through Jesus is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So basically what he's, he's setting the stage to say this, that you and I are, fall, uh, are, are fallen human beings. One of, my interest, one of my favorite things to think about or to say is that even if you're not quite sure about this Jesus thing, all of us would say whatever our standard of morality might be, all of, all of us have done things that, if we're being honest, we would admit are wrong, right? So if we've done things that we would say, yeah, we shouldn't have done that, then if God is perfect and holy and righteous, we've certainly fallen short of his standard. So what does he do? Instead of condemning us and turning his back on us, he sends Jesus to give us grace, forgiveness, and mercy because we are sinners. All of us have fallen short 
of God's perfect standard and have chosen to go our own way. So he sends Jesus so that we can experience the righteousness of him. And then he says this, my favorite part, verses 1 and 2 in chapter 2. He says, my little children, I am writing these things so that you may not sin. So again, he's encouraging us to walk in the light. But since all of us will sin, even in that, he says this. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate, the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. One of the best ways you, that, that I've heard this passage taught, one of the best analogies I could give you, is think of it like this. Like if you have a child uh, and your child is taking steps for the first time, when a, when, a, when a child begins to walk, they're really not walking, right? What they're doing is surviving, right? They let go of mom and dad or the couch or the coffee table and their big head falls forward and they take a step, step, step and they fall, right? Because they, they can't really walk yet, but they're, but they're learning. And when that happens, what happens? What do mom and dad do? They celebrate, they're excited, they're high-fiving, the kid's got a bloody nose because he fell on the ground and they're picking them back up so they can record another video. Even I was guilty of this last year, our Roman, our son, uh, when he first began to walk, he was taking his first steps and I had my phone out and he face-planted. Now don't get me in trouble because you have done this too and if you don't have kids yet, you will, okay? So don't like get me in trouble for this. He face-planted. Now I could have caught him, but I was too busy trying to record what was happening? So I have this video of my phone of him taking two or three steps and just, just eating it. Now we're on the carpet, so he's okay. And he's a tough kid. What happened there, right? I was so excited knowing that he was going to fall. I was still excited. Why? Because he was walking. And what you and I need to know as we try to follow Jesus in our life, and not just spiritually and having faith, but honoring him and how we treat one another, how we uh, treat our bodies, how we work hard at our jobs, what we need to know is that when we fall short, God is not looking down from heaven and saying, idiot. He's not looking down from heaven and saying, you did it again. What he's saying is that because of Jesus, who is our advocate, uh, he's looking down from heaven and saying, that is my son, that is my daughter, and they're walking. They're walking. In other words, when we talk about this idea of progress, here's what we need to know. That you can't be perfect, but you can make progress, right? Literally, what we just read, you cannot be perfect. You cannot be perfect before God. You cannot be perfect in your job. You cannot always be perfect in your marriage or in your relationships with your friends or your roommates. Uh, you cannot be perfect uh, with your kids and how you parent. You can't be perfect in your health. You, none of us can be perfect in any way. But that doesn't mean you can't make progress. In other words, you can. Here, here's what I kind of think of it this way. Like whenever you have a goal, whether it's, I don't know, reading through the Bible every day or a health and fitness goal or a job goal, whatever it is, what happens is often is if we mess up, let's just use an easy example. Let's say you're trying to get healthy and you're working out and you're trying to avoid not eating bad foods. And let's say someone in the office brings in, you have lunch catered and you eat a donut or a cookie and you shouldn't have ate it. And so you think, well, I blew it today, and so I might as well give up, right? Since I can't be perfect today, I might as well not even try, right? What happens is we say, I'll try tomorrow, or, or the, the, maybe we'll try to read the Bible in a year. Now we're in March, and you, if that was your goal, and maybe you've missed a few days, and so you already know that you're not going to read the Bible in the year, and so you think, well, maybe I'll just try again next year. I'll go back to reading the Bible when I can, but I'm not going to make a commitment out of it because I've already blown it. And I say that to say this. That in my opinion, here's the biggest thing that prohibits us from making progress, and that's perfection. In other words, perfection will always hinder progress. If your goal is perfection, you will never get there, right? Again, when we talk about spiritually and following Jesus, what do we say? Well, I've sinned this week or today, and so I'll try again next week. I'll try again next month. I'll, I'll try again next year because I, I'm not a perfect follower of Jesus. So what's the point? What does John say here? That Jesus is on the right, as at the right hand of God, advocating for us, saying that is my son, that is my daughter, and He celebrates when we walk. So perfection will always enter progress. Perfection or uh, prohibited. Perfection is not our goal, but progress is that we can walk in the light of Jesus, that we can trust Him. And so again, this is not just spiritual that we're talking about here. That Jesus cares about all aspects of our life, and so, 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 and so you're at home right now. And what does it look like to still grow spiritually? What does it look like to still love your spouse or to try to be healthy? Uh, again, what the point is this, that Jesus is not asking you to be perfect. He's asking you to walk. He's asking you to take steps. So again, for us right now, 
During this coronavirus pandemic, when we're at home way more than we might want to be, we're around the same people every single day, and we might be going crazy. What does it look like, instead of being the perfect spouse or the perfect roommate or the perfect parent or the perfect employee, what does it look like instead simply to walk? What does it look like to walk with your kids through this? What does it look like to walk with your spouse through this? What does it look like? to walk in your job if you're still able to work at this time through this. Not that you're going to be perfect, but how can you and I set healthy rhythms so that even when life is difficult and not the way that we want it to be, that we can still experience progress? Because what did Christ do? He said, you will fall short, but I have come. And so I'm inviting you to take steps in your life so that you can love and that you can trust, that you can follow him. It's inviting us in that. Again, Jesus is not asking you to be perfect because you and I can't be. He's asking you to walk, and you and I can walk. And so really the point of what we're getting at is how do we experience progress if we can't be perfect? Here's what I want us to know, that Jesus' perfection allows us to experience progress. It's not you're trying really hard and you always getting it right because you won't, but it's Jesus. He allows us to experience progress. What does it say? That we get, Scripture says that we get the righteousness and the perfection of God. That God, if you are in Christ and have trusted and followed and believed in Jesus, even in the midst of your doubts and your questions and you're getting it wrong, that that God looks at us the same way that he looks at Jesus. That is perfect and righteous and holy. And so we don't follow God trying to get things from him or trying to impress him. We follow God in response to the goodness of life that he's given us. That Jesus is perfect, so we don't have to be. That Jesus is perfect, and so we follow the light. And then when we blow it, again, maybe we sin, maybe we uh, speak poorly or negatively and react negatively to our spouse or our roommate or a coworker, that, ge- that God is not saying, well, you've blown it, too bad, we'll try again next year. He's saying, right now, there's grace and there's forgiveness for you. And it's through Jesus and his perfection that we experience progress, that we can continue to follow and trust in him even when life looks crazy. I love what it says in Philippians uh, chapter 3, verse 12. Paul, who's kind of one of the heroes of the faith. This guy is shipwrecked, beaten, jailed, uh, stoned to the point of death, and all these things for the sake of Christ. If there's anyone who we might say, he's, he knows what he's doing, here's what he says about this idea of progress and following Jesus. In verse 12, it says, Not that I have already reached the goal or am already perfect, But I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal uh, the prized promise by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. What is the goal? that you and I would be able to experience the grace and mercy and gift of God, and that one day, because of Christ's perfection and not ours, we will be able to uh, spend eternity in his kingdom where there is no more pain, suffering, or death. And so he's saying, press on. And so here's what I want to say to you this evening. Press on. What does it look like to press on maybe in a new exercise routine? Right? You're not going to be perfect. You can't go to the gym three times a week. You can't do the things you want to do, but it doesn't mean we don't do anything. What does it look like to press on and walk? and make progress in your health? Uh, What does it look like to press on if you have to homeschool your kids and you have no idea what you're doing? Again, you're not going to teach your kids everything, but what are some small things that you can press on and walk in? What does it look like to press on to give grace to your spouse or to your roommates during this time? If you're married or if you have roommates and you're with them all the time and you might be driving each other crazy, you've probably said or done some things you wish you hadn't. What does it look like to extend grace to them as they extend grace to you? What does it look like to press on and love them well during this time. What does it look like to press on in your goal or in your job, right? As followers of Christ, we want to be uh, the best employees that we can be. We want to work hard and, and, and show, uh, show people how Christ has changed us. And so we want to respect and care for those that we are around in our workplaces. What does it look like to press on in your job? It's different. But just because it's different, it doesn't mean that we can't shine the light of Christ in whatever place we find ourselves. And finally, what does it look like to press on in your relationship with Christ. Again, not that he's obtained perfection, Paul hasn't, but he's pressing on, that he's following Jesus and he's continuing to grow closer to him no matter what circumstances that he might find himself in. And that is also true for us. What does it look like for you and I, not just to say when life gets back to normal, 
then I'll start, you know, reading the Bible again, or I'll start praying again, or I'll start, you know, spending time with God. What does it look like to press on now? You may not be able to get away like you did before because your kids or your roommates and they're everywhere, but what does it look like to press on with your relationship with Christ? Again, remember that it's not about what we have done. It's about what Christ has done. And it is Jesus' perfection that allows you and I to experience progress. It is Jesus' perfection that allows us to take steps even when we blow it and even when we fall. Don't let this uh, idea of perfection that you and I cannot reach prohibit us from being taking steps of progress in our relationships, in our families, in our jobs, and most importantly, in our relationship with Christ. Things look different, but let's press on because Christ's perfection has been handed to us. And so when we fall short and when we blow it, God is still there and he's still there and he still cares. And we know that because he sent Jesus to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. It is in Christ that we get to experience the grace and mercy of and love of the Father, and so it is in Him that we press on and place our hope and our trust. And so with that, Kevin's going to sing us another song as we sit and reflect on the goodness of who God is, and what He has done for us, and the sacrifice that He has made that we can experience progress because of His perfection. And so let's listen to Kevin and even sing along if you'd like as he sings and leads us in a song of worship. Christ is my reward and all my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy. Through every trial, my soul will sing, no turning back. Been set free. Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need. Christ, my own. Joy of my salvation and this hope will never fail. This heaven is our home through every storm. My soul will sing, Jesus is here to God be the glory. Christ. He's enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need. Christ is enough for me. Christ is for me everything I need is in you everything I need I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. And Christ is enough for me. And Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything. 
everything I need. And Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need, I have decided to follow Jesus. Thanks, Kevin, for leading us this evening. And I just want to let you know this Sunday is Easter. And so we're going to give you a special invitation to join us right here on Facebook or YouTube, wherever you're watching this, at 10 a.m. as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Even in the midst of all this difference and unknown and not being able to gather physically, we still have a king who's on his throne and we can't wait to celebrate. And so be sure to uh, follow us on social media, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. We've got a lot of uh, different resources and, and things just like this to share with you guys. Uh, while we're staying home, so connect with us that way. And uh, thanks so much for spending a few, a few minutes with us this evening as we worship Jesus and be encouraged with one another. We'll see you soon.